so getting started, what is website help? At its most basic level, it's essentially just, is your website working as intended? Is it performing op optimally uh, for users and search engines? So this includes a broad range of technical SEO aspects that impact how search engines are able to crawl, understand, and rank your website content. We use, um, there's a lot of different softwares that can do these scans and assess your website health and give it a percentage. Um, on the right, you can see some examples of uh, what we pulled from our website health scan. Uh, you can see the example here, the left image uh, sitting at around a 69%. Um, and then you can see on that kind of lower red arrow, um, 92 is kind of the benchmark for the top 10% of websites. We see a lot of variation in website health score. Um, anything from, I think some of the lowest I've seen is like in the 50s. Um, the highest I've seen is 99. So there's a huge variation. And obviously it depends a lot on, um, you know, what content management system you're using, how often you're updating your website, um, how familiar you are with technical SEO, um, how many people are working on your website, a wide variety of factors. Um, my personal benchmark is if I see anything lower than 85, um, it's kind of a con cause for concern. I think, you know, it's time to maybe dedicate some time to getting this score up. Um, obviously, the higher, the better. Um, and that 92 benchmark there isn't unattainable. I'd see I've seen a large portion of websites at that. Um, so with 85 being kind of the maybe cause for concern, um, that certainly doesn't mean kind of quit there. Um, if you get your site audit, it's around there. You know, you always want to get the higher, the better, because the better score, the better user experience, the better SEO, the better your website's going to perform. Uh, that right image, you see a little snapshot of kind of uh, the crawl page process. Uh, so in the specific example, it crawled a little over a thousand pages, and it kind of gives a breakdown of, you know, what are healthy, what are completely broken, uh, what have issues, redirects, and then ones that are blocked from crawling. Uh, you can see in the lower image, it breaks it down into three categories in order of severity. Um, errors on the far left being the most severe, they have the biggest impact on your site health um, and are the most important kind of issues to address. And we'll delve a little bit more into the different kinds of issues uh, a little bit later. The middle category is warnings. Uh, they do have a pretty severe impact, but aren't as serious as errors. Um, and then the final category notices are things that you should be aware of, things that you should be working on, um, but may not be as important to worry about until you address all the errors and warnings that you can address. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of different softwares that can kind of scan your website um, and give you a website health report. Uh, the one we use is very detailed, very thorough. Um, it does a great job. It identifies around 100 different potential issues you could have on your website. Um, and this is important because a lot of the issues that it addresses aren't necessarily visible um, on the front end, or even if you're just taking a glance on the back end of your website. Um, I've seen a lot of websites where I look at it on the front end, um, just on a cursory glance, it looks great, it looks beautiful, the content looks great, the design is great, um, and you would think it'd be a super high health score, and then when you scan it, it's a lot lower. Uh, due to a lot of kind of hidden issues. And then I've seen the exact opposite where some websites uh, look a little dated, they don't look um, as well put together and their score is higher than the nice websites. Uh, so it really just depends um, on such a wide variety of factors. And that's why these audits are extremely important because it gives a lot of insight into issues that you otherwise probably wouldn't even know are there. I touched on this a little bit already but website health is extremely important um, for a wide variety of reasons, but most broadly for user experience and SEO. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of the issues that it identifies kind of have a uh, tie into how Google and other search engines are able to crawl, understand, and rank your website. Um, so if you're, even if you're doing a lot of great keyword research, you're putting out a lot of fresh content, uh, things of that nature, if you have these kind of underlying technical SEO issues, um, that keyword research and that fresh content might not be enough. Then as it relates to user experience, um, say you're doing good on the SEO aspect, um, your other digital marketing efforts are good, but when people get to your website, um, you have some issues that you might not really 
be it from, you know, you don't have the outside perspective or uh, you might not be issues in your mind. Uh, the user kind of it hinders their experience on your website and they might get on your website, uh, be it from social media, from paid ads, from organic, uh, and then immediately leave hurting your bounce rate, hurting your possibility for conversions. Website health is especially important thing to discuss because, you know, when you think digital marketing services, you think social media, you think paid advertising, uh, maybe some video marketing, email marketing, um, kind of those common go-to digital marketing services, which are extremely important. Uh, but website health is something that doesn't always really pop into mind for most people. Um, and digital marketing services, the success of them are extremely interrelated. Uh, so like I kind of alluded to, if you you have a really great paid ad strategy, you have really strong uh, and varied social media, um, you're doing some keyword research, all of that is great. Uh, but if your website health score is really low, all of those efforts, uh, their success is really hindered. Um, and you kind of need to maybe re realign your priorities or dedicate some more time to your website health so that the success of your other campaigns can really shine through. Uh, there's a lot of, like I said, about 100 different kind of issues that our specific software scans for. Um, if I went through all of those, we'd be here probably a day or two. So I grouped uh, them into just five kind of broad categories of issues that we see a lot across pretty much all different platforms, um, different industries, uh, different age of websites. Uh, these issues are issues we see a lot. And they're also issues um, that to an extent you can resolve on your own if you don't have like coding or web development experience. Uh, so we'll dive into some subcategory issues within these broad categories uh, so you guys kind of know what to look for on your website and see um, if any of these issues you possibly have or become aware of any issues that maybe you didn't know were a potential problem. So kind of as the name indicates, uh, duplicate content is just any content, be it uh, the text content on a page, uh, your meta descriptions, your title tags, um, any kind of text content that is 85% identical or more uh, across two or more pages. Uh, and this is an issue because uh, Google kind of sees it as you being trying to like trick the system or maybe being a little um, trying to work your way around it. Uh, in the past, you know, people get knocked for keyword stuffing where you'll read a page and it's super obvious that they just keep saying like, if it's a service page and say, um, you're a chiropractor, and then every other sentence is chiropractor, chiropractor, chiropractor. Uh, Google started knocking you for keyword stuffing. Um, and in the past, people would do a lot of where at the bottom of the page, you'd put a big chunk of white text uh, with just listing off all your keywords so that you know users wouldn't see it. But Google, when it would scan, it would pick it up. And you know they kind of caught on to that. So they're trying to be more um, intuitive and adaptive to these strategies to not allow people to kind of trick the system or get cheap at, uh, SEO. So we see this in kind of a wide variety of categories. Uh, sometimes it's if uh, someone publishes, maybe they have a blog that performed really well, and it's been a couple of years, and then they want to re-put the blog out, so they just copy paste the same blog. Uh, we can also see it, uh, for example, if you're a law firm or a bank and there's kind of a common like financial scam that's all of a sudden popped up you might do like a news release on the financial scam to alert people um, a blog discussing the financial scam and then on your if you have like a fraud prevention and financial scams page you have that content um, and so although they're the three they're three related topics uh, if you're kind of copying pasting large chunks of content across all three it will um, see that as all three kind of duplicate content. And Google will typically filter out all the flagged pages but one. Um, and you can't really guarantee which one's going to get flagged out or not. So if you're, like I mentioned, a bank and you write those three pages, say they filter out your service page and your blog, and then someone just finds the news release, uh, you probably would prefer them to find your fraud prevention services page so that they can contact you for that service. They know you offer that service, but then that page is getting hidden because you have that duplicate content. And that's not to say you can't have like three related pages on the same topic. Um, you just can't copy paste the same chunks of content. 
you have to rewrite, rephrase, vary length, vary the wording. Um, so you can still have some more content. You just need to make sure you're switching it up. Um, and then the next level, um, depending on the extent, severity, and frequency of how much dupl duplicate content you have on your website, um, Google sometimes sees it as more malicious. You know, if it happens um, that first example I gave where you maybe just copy paste an old blog and you do that like once or twice, that might not be the end of the world. But if you're doing that on a regular basis or um, pretty much every page on your website is the same, has the same chunks to some extent, uh, it sees this as malicious and it can result in your page being downgraded or even banned. So no one will find it when they search for it which is obviously a serious issue. Um, when it comes to user experience, this also clutters the website and creates redundant content. Users typically uh, go in knowing what they're looking for, uh, or even if they're just kind of looking around, wanting to learn more about your website. In either of those instances, if you have the same or very similar content all across your website, you know, it's not engaging, it's not interesting, uh, it's not persuasive, it's kind of boring. And so they're more likely than not going to jump off your page, hurt your bounce rate, and you're not going to get that conversion, be it a call, a contact, a purchase, things of that nature. So it just creates a lot of issues that are pretty easily avoided with just some rephrasing, rewording, uh, restructuring. Meta descriptions are another area where we see a variety of issues. Um, if you're not familiar, you can see in that little snippet on the bottom, that's a meta description. It is just that little snippet that shows up in search results under your URL, your name, your title, and then your little snippet is your meta description. Uh, we see a lot of different issues with this, one being duplicate meta descriptions across a website. So be it for simplicity's sake, uh, time's sake, effort's sake, sometimes people will just use the same or a slightly switched up meta description on every page of their website. So say you're a plumbing company and you make your meta description, we are Iowa's premier plumbing company, call us today at number, number, number for premier plumbing services. That would be a great meta description for a contact page, but for an FAQ page or your drain service page, you know, that's not really reflective of what the page is. Um, it's not hitting any keywords related to the page. So it's not really giving Google the most relevant results as well as from a user experience. Uh, they're not really, it's not as enticing, you know? So if maybe they're Googling, uh, when is it time to call a plumber? Or when should I get my sewer inspected? And then they just see that little snippet, your snippet pops up for your FAQ page, your service page, and they just see, call us today. Mm, they might not click that. Whereas if it says, if you're seeing these signs, you should call a plumber, click to learn what the signs are. Well, then they're gonna be more enticed, they're gonna click. Uh, so for both SEO and for user experience, you want those meta descriptions to be different. Uh, for some of the same reasons as the duplicate meta descriptions, you also see, we see a lot of blank meta descriptions. Uh, it is, depending on how many pages of your website, it can be time consuming to sit down and write a good meta description. Uh, it can be just sometimes overlooked or forgotten. And these blank meta descriptions our Google will sometimes just pull what it thinks is maybe a relevant meta description from your page if you don't have one. And this can be fine in some instances, but a lot of times um, it's not necessarily reflective of what you'd like. They pull what their crawlers think are the best, uh, but it's probably not really the content you would really want as to be reflected, be, the, be it uh, not as reflective of the page, not as engaging, there's no calls to action, things of that nature. Uh, as well as just not being as most engaging for the user. So you don't want to really leave those blank. Uh, too long and too short meta descriptions are things we see a lot. You want to aim for around 160 characters, uh, as close as you can get to that without going over. If they're too long, Google will just kind of cut off at that 160 point, even if it's in the middle of a sentence or even a word, uh, which looks unprofessional as well as I've seen sometimes where uh, depending on what the word is, if it cuts it off at kind of an awkward point, uh, it can be some like kind of comical or unprofessional results. So you want to make sure you're avoiding that. And if it's too short, again, it looks unprofessional. You're not really giving enough information. Uh, so just, we usually kind of stick to the method of, you know, explaining a little bit about what the page is about, 
um, and then some kind of call to action, like, you know, learn more today, call today, uh, email us, things of that nature. Poorly written meta descriptions. This is more for a user experience. And I've kind of touched on uh, some of the topics. Obviously, duplicate, blank, too long, too short are all kind of tie into poorly written. I've also seen a lot of people kind of do that keyword stuffing thing I mentioned where they'll just put their meta description as like a list of keywords related to the page, which again is not super interesting for a user to look at and looks kind of tacky. Uh, additionally, a lot more than you'd think you see spelling errors, grammar errors, random capitalization, or a lot of times people will just copy the whole first paragraph of a page as their meta description, uh, which is just not the way to do it. So there are a lot of things to take into consideration. You know, you just want it to be convey the message of the page and be around that 160 character mark. Text content is extremely important. I'm a little biased as a copywriter, but this is an issue I like to really hammer into the heads of every client of, you know, this is something that needs constant attention. This is something that needs to be done well. This is something that needs to be addressed. We touched a little bit already on duplicate content, just making sure that your content is varied. Uh, it's different from page to page, even if the pages are similar. Low word count is another important one. Uh, the standard SEO best practice is at least 200 words on a page. Obviously, that can be a bit tricky for some pages, say like a contact page, or if it's just a staff page where it's like name, job, started in, uh, interest. That can sometimes be hard to get to 200 words. And, you know, if it's just those couple pages, it's not really the end of the world. But if you're having any blog, news, release, press release, uh, any service page, if you're e-commerce, any like product category page, you really need to be that 200 words is a real minimum there for making sure you're getting that SEO best practice. It also gives you the opportunity to work in a lot of keywords, a lot of information to write persuasive and informational content for your users. Uh, there's just a lot of things that make that extremely important. And it kind of ties into that next issue of low text to HTML ratio, which is essentially just the uh, percentage of text on your page versus the percentage of code on your page. Uh, so if you have a lot more code, be it videos, images, stylization, uh, maybe like interactive design elements, uh, that page is a lot heavier on that content than text content which causes a variety of issues. Obviously, um, Google kind of likes you to have a lot of text content to back up your visual content. Uh, and additionally, it can kind of slow down a page to have a lot of heavy coding on it. Um, page load speed is a huge issue in Google's eyes as well as the user eyes. user's eyes. I read the other day, it takes, it's like an average of like three to six seconds. If a page takes longer than that to load, a user's just gonna leave. So if you have a, low, a lot of low text to HTML ratio issues, uh, it's probably hurting your load speed, which is hurting your user experience and your uh, SEO. Heading hierarchy is another extremely important topic that's uh, often overlooked, either in importance or just in understanding. So you know your H1 is your title, the primary descriptor of your page. Uh, sometimes people kind of just do every, like every heading as an H1 or every heading as an H2. The issue with having more than one H1 is Google reads your H1 as your primary topic, and that's how it kind of understands whatever page it's on, and then chooses that H1 to serve it, rank it, crawl it. So, for example, if you're, you do recipe blogs, and you have a blog uh, coming out this week on ideas for Thanksgiving leftover recipes, that's your H1. And then say your H2, or you do another H1, and it's um, ingredients, and then your next H1 is prep, and then your next H1 is best ways to serve. Uh, Google will see, since they're all H1s, they're all equally important, uh, when obviously, you know, how to serve isn't as important as the title, because people aren't gonna be searching just how to serve, they're gonna be searching that title. So for H1s, you want just one, you want it to be concise, clear, have at least one of your keywords in it. And then to just, for the user experience, follow kind of a logical heading hierarchy, um, it breaks up the text nicely. So, you know, you have your H1, which is the primary, you have your H2, maybe a little, one or two H3s under it, another H2 with some more H3s, and then you end with that kind of call to action and then H4 or an H5. Uh, creates a good visual breakup 
and it makes the content a lot easier for users to scan and is a little less intimidating. It's kind of broken up. It makes sense. There's a logical flow. Similar to meta descriptions, uh, you want to kind of watch your character limit for either too much or not enough text. Uh, for meta descriptions, it's 160, around 160. Uh, for titles, it's around 60. Uh, same issue as with the meta description. If you have too much, you know, it's going to truncate it weird. It's also from a user. If you have like a super long title, it's not as eye-catching. It's not as quick to read. It's not as engaging. Um, and on the opposite side of that, if you have not enough text in your title tags, uh, for example, if you're writing digital marketing blogs and the page that those blog lives on is just called blogs, uh, Google doesn't really know, okay, are these digital marketing blogs, are these financial blogs, are these legal blogs, are these recipe blogs? And so when someone searches digital marketing blogs, uh, because you don't have a long enough or reflective enough title, your competitors are probably going to be ranked above you because you're not being specific enough in your title. Links are another area where we see a lot of issues. Uh, you can see our first two are kind of related to anchor text. We have that little snippet there. So anchor text is important for a variety of reasons. Uh, user experience, obviously, uh, you don't want a super long. The URL example here is pretty short, but sometimes they can get pretty long. You don't want a big block URL. Um, you also don't want for WCAG compliance for people who use like screen readers or other assistive technologies. When it reads that URL, it will read the entire thing like character by character. So potentially if you have like a hundred character URL, the user has to sit there and just listen to every single character. And they also have no context as to what the URL is. Um, and so for Google, for an SEO standpoint, it gives some context as to the importance or relevance of the link. So you can see uh, on this example would be www.globalreach slash services the UR is the URL. So instead of saying like, learn more about our web development services here and then putting the link, you kind of put that hyperlink on the thing you're discussing. And that's where descriptive anchor text come in, comes in. A lot of people will put anchor text on like the words learn more or click here or just website. Um, and although that is anchor text, that's not descriptive. Uh, it's not telling whose website. It's not telling uh, like why I would click here, what I'm learning more about. So you need to be descriptive when you put that anchor text. Lack of internal links is another important factor. Um, internal links are just links on one page that lead to another page on your website. Uh, a strong internal linking structure is really important for both user experience and SEO. Uh, for user experience, you know, they see that link and go, oh, I didn't know they did this service or they had a blog about this. So it kind of keeps them on your website longer. It gets them to go to more pages of your website, which uh, kind of builds up your analytics as well as possibly getting them to make a conversion by learning about a service or a product or something that they didn't potentially know you offered. From an SEO perspective, it kind of helps crawlers understand what pages are important on your website. SEO best practice is to have at least two internal links uh, leading to one page that exists on different pages. Uh, again, this kind of ties into not every page would need that. If you just did like a uh, news update on like, hey, our hours are changing this Friday or we're closed for Christmas, you don't really need a ton of internal links leading to that. Uh, but anything that's kind of evergreen content, so like services, uh, primary products, your blog page itself, you want uh, at least two links on other pages leading to that page so that Google sees, oh, okay, they have a lot of links leading to this page. This is important, but that's not to say every other line is hyperlinked. That's looks kind of cluttered and is just a lot for crawlers and for users. Broken links is another issue that we see a lot more than you would think. It seems kind of simple, you know, uh, obviously I check my links. I click, if I'm on my like service page a lot, I can tell if I click a link and it's broken. Uh, we see this issue mostly when it's an older page or especially when, uh, say you do blog, like we do bi-monthly blogs. We're not going through and going and looking at our blogs from 2015 and looking at every blog and clicking on every link. So over time, you know, links change, uh, websites get taken down, redirects, things of that nature, and those links will break and you might not even know. We also sometimes see, you know, 
ransomware or viruses or kind of hacks where uh, they will change links on older pages or blogs and it will the anchor text will still look the same so it'll be like um, click your, or like learn more about this service and when you it looks normal but when you click it it takes you to like a spam website or a malicious website or an inappropriate website and obviously when Google sees that it thinks you're kind of trying to push people to malicious websites and so you'll get knocked for that and if you are not aware of these issues it can become a potential problem and if you have the time to scroll through every link on your website every month, that's more power to you, but that is a lot of links for a lot of people to crawl through. Another issue we see is link formats. Uh, there's a lot that fall under this, but um, just three kind of basic ones. No follow attributes, so telling Google not to follow that link that you have somewhere on your website. And then that kind of causes Google to question, okay, why do they, if you have a ton of them, why do they not want us to follow this? Are they linking somewhere malicious or spammy that they don't want us to see? And so it's kind of a little suspicious in Google's eyes. Um, if your links are too long, uh, so the kind of benchmark for it being too long is right around like 2000 characters, which seems like a lot, but isn't uh, all that rare. Uh, and this is just some browsers can't handle this. It also makes crawling harder. Um, and if you have too many of them or if they're well over 2000, the crawlers will just kind of ignore them and then potentially important links are getting overlooked or ignored. Uh, it's kind of along the same line as too many link parameters. So, you know, you can add parameters to uh, track, filter, organize your links, uh, especially from a digital marketing perspective, those tracking parameters are really important and definitely not saying don't have some link parameters, uh, but if you're adding a ton of link parameters to every single link on your website, it kind of gives that same issue of like, it's too complex for crawlers. They'll just ignore the links, uh, it's just kind of overwhelming. Our last kind of category we'll touch on is images. Uh, that first bullet there, alt text kind of ties back to the WCAG compliance we discussed with anchor text. Alt text, as you can see in that little middle example, is just kind of a kind of like a caption uh, that describes what an image is. I can't see it on the front end unless you are using uh, like an assistive technology like a screen reader. And that's kind of its primary purpose uh, is for screen readers. Obviously, if someone has a visual impairment, they can't really see the image. So their screen reader uses alt text to tell them what the image is uh, so they can know what they're looking at. Um, and then it also has kind of a hidden like SEO benefit as well. Uh, you can see here we have our little example uh, example of an internet navigation from Global Reach. So if someone was searching, you know, on Google, you have your all results uh, like news, images, videos. If someone was looking like, what does an internet navigation look like? And then they clicked on images because that internet navigation keyword is in my alt text, that image will pop up and then they could click on it, come to my website, come to my blog, and they might not have found my blog otherwise. So kind of has that hidden SEO benefit. Um, on SiteViz, if you double click on an image, it'll give you this pop-up box. On WordPress, I know in the gallery, when you upload your images to the image gallery, um, click on an image, you can add alt text. Uh, kind of varies where on each platform you can add alt text, but all platforms should have that uh, alternative text option since it is a WCAG compliance factor. Broken images, kind of similar concept to broken links. Uh, you know, if there's older posts or pages that you're not checking as often, uh, up website updates uh, could break an image, or if you're pulling the image from a different website and they take it down or change the URL, you know, it could break the image. So Google kind of sees that as, you know, you're not keeping your you're not keeping an eye on your website. You're not updating things. You're not making things sure, making sure things are healthy, uh, as well as users. You know, if they do stumble upon an older post and see a broken image, it just looks unprofessional. That next one, page link format. Uh, we refer back to the image in the middle. Uh, that top tab next to image info, it says link. So you can add a link uh, and kind of format your image as a link. So when someone clicks on it, it'll take them to whatever that link is you put in. Um, in some instances, like perhaps e-commerce, this actually is, could be beneficial, you know, if you have a necklace and it's kind of smaller and hard to see, and then if they click on the image and it opens in a new tab uh, with that link format, and then it's a full page image and they can look at the necklace up close, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but 
for non-e-commerce, obviously with some exceptions, uh, it doesn't really make sense to do that. Uh, that's kind of where you would want to do instead that anchor text uh, I had mentioned. So if you're wanting people to click on the image to learn more about your intranets, instead of putting it in the link, you would just put below like, learn more about our internet solutions and then put that anchor text on internet solutions so they can go to that page and learn about it that way. Not enough images is a little bit more of a user experience one, but does have some SEO with that alt text. Um, obviously we're visual people. And so if people land on an extremely text heavy page without any images breaking it up, or even if it's a shorter page and doesn't have any kind of immediate eye catching image, uh, you're going to hurt your bounce rate. You're not going to pe get people as engaged. Uh, so it's kind of best practice just to have at least one image on every page, be it a like real image, a stock image, a fun graphic, uh, something of that nature, just something to get have people immediately catch their eye and maybe break up longer text as they read. We talked a little bit about heavy images already when we talk, talked about the uh, text to HTML ratio. If you have like really big images, a page with a ton of images, non-compressed images, uh, it slows down your load speed a lot, which naturally causes a lot of issues for both users and for Google. Uh, so these are just a couple of the issues when it comes to images. And a broad overview of those kind of categories of issues that you might be able to uh, fix yourself without a ton of like web development or coding experience. There are a whole plethora beyond that of kind of advanced issues that if you don't have that experience, it might be difficult to fix yourself. And if you do try to go it yourself, you could potentially break something that you might not be able to fix. These are just a couple broad categories. Uh, one that's really important is your sitemap and your robot.txt file. Uh, so if you add new pages, make updates to your website, changes, um, those changes aren't reflected in either of those files. Uh, it can cause a lot of crawlability and indexing issues. Structured data like schema markup can be really great for SEO. You know, it can help with local search. It can help kind of better serve your services and products to users. Uh, but if you're creating that schema markup, markup incorrectly or missing something when you create it, or on the other end, if you're implementing it incorrectly or both, uh, you might not know that necessarily. It might not cause any like if you're missing part of your schema markup, you're doing part of it incorrectly, it might not mess necessarily like break your website or break the page and the front end will look the same because you don't really see the schema markup on the front end. Uh, so you might not even know it's an issue, but in Google's eyes, it's there's an issue there. Load speed, we touched on a lot already, so I won't talk too much about it. Uh, but when it comes to load speed, there's a lot of factors that once it comes to, you know, if you've already uh, optimize some of your images, you've kind of produced heavy stuff, but it's still loading really slow. It might be time to involve a web developer uh, or a designer to kind of help you solve those issues. And then crawlability encompasses obviously a huge range of issues. Um, some of the one, easier ones we've touched on in terms of crawlability when it comes to like links, uh, uh, anchor text, things of that nature, uh, intuitive navigation. But there are kind of more in-depth ones like meta tags, uh, compressing or minifying JavaScript, JavaScript and CSS. Uh, if you have blocked pages, if you have pages that are unable to be crawled for a specific reason, um, that might be something that you're not able to really identify or resolve on your own. But it's obviously a serious issue because if search engines can't crawl your website, they can't rank it and they can't serve it to people. Um, so these are just kind of some broad issues. And that kind of ties into our last little segment. Um, if you guys want, I'm going to drop in the chat a URL for you guys to just put in your email and your homepage uh, URL. And we can, after this, run a site audit for you. Uh, we'll email it to you. And then you can see what percentage you're sitting at. Uh, if you know there's cause for concern, if there's something maybe you should be addressing, or if you're sitting happy and healthy, uh, you'll have some context now into the importance of it. So you can kind of understand a little bit more what that percentage is.